Hello and welcome to Lecture 7 of Foundations of Artificial Intelligence. Today we're going to be covering reasoning in first order logic. In our last lecture, we started by defining predicate logic. Next we went through and discussed the new syntax introduced by predicate logic, including constants, variables, predicates, quantifiers, and equality. Next we revisited equivalence, again now from the perspective of first order logic. We examined how you could use propositional equivalence in first order logic, and we also introduced some new rules of equivalence in the context of having quantifiers. Lastly, we dove into predicate logic semantics. This included learning about interpretation, we defined what domain means in first order logic, and we examined substitution and its unique importance in reasoning in first order logic. Then we redefined satisfiability and validity, again in the context of first order logic, and lastly, we learned three basic approaches to determining truth in first order logic. Before diving into today's lecture, let's have a little bit of fun. Specifically, armed with our knowledge of representation in first order logic, we have this following challenge. Here we see six images of famous or historical people. Above them, you'll see first order logic formulas. Each of these corresponds to a famous quote by that respective individual. In a moment, pause this video and take some time to see if you can decode each of these propositional formulas. On the left we have Richard Nixon, then Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., John F. Kennedy, Elvis, and Thomas Jefferson. When we get together in class, we'll see which ones you were able to decode. Go ahead and pause your video now. Okay, moving on, here's today's lecture outline. We're going to start today by covering first order logic inference rules, as well as theorem proofs. Then we'll spend the rest of the lecture learning different strategies to go about reasoning in first order logic. We'll start by looking at inference via propositionalization, and then we'll transition into inference without propositionalization. Next, we'll revisit resolution, which we learned about in propositional logic. But now we'll show how we can adapt the resolution process to first order logic. Next, we're going to actually go back to propositional logic, and in that context, we're going to learn about something called horn clauses and chaining. This will segue into learning about chaining in the context of first order logic. As we learned before, quantifiers are an important component of first order logic's expressive power. However, they're ultimately disruptive for automatic inference. Specifically, they make the structure of formulas more complex, and they increase the number of applicable inference rules in every step of a proof. In other words, there are more possible ways to transform a formula when you're doing a proof search. As we move from inference in propositional logic to predicate logic, the good news is that inference in first order logic builds on inference from propositional logic. However, things are going to get a bit more complicated here. As we learned at the end of the last lecture, you could reduce a first order logic knowledge base to propositional logic and then use the propositional logic inference strategies that we already covered. However, the ability to do this really depends on the problem or the domain, and this can be very computationally expensive either way. Instead, it can be more efficient to construct inference rules that work directly with first order logic sentences. Today, we're going to consider both of these approaches. As a refresher, here are the propositional logic inference rules that we learned previously. For instance, remember modus ponens, modus tollens, and resolution which are probably the most important ones to think about as we move forward here today. Now let's learn about the inference rules that are unique to first order logic. First, let's learn about inference rules that deal with quantifiers in first order logic. There are two main categories. The first is instantiation. Here we convert sentences with quantifiers to propositions without. In other words, this allows us to propositionalize any first order logic sentence or knowledge base. This includes universal instantiation and existential instantiation. We also have generalization, including universal and existential generalization. We'll go into greater depth for each next. First, we have universal instantiation, otherwise known as universal elimination. This rule says that any universally quantified variable in a true sentence is replaced, in other words, substituted, by an appropriate term from the domain. The result of this is a true sentence. For all x, px, therefore pc. Universal instantiation has the following assumptions. First off, c from pc is a constant in the domain of x. Also, x is a variable that is not within the scope of a quantifier for c. 
In other words, x can be replaced by any ground terms. Let's walk through an example of universal instantiation. h1 and h2 are the formulas that make up our original knowledge base. In this case, we have all cats can't catch mice, represented by this formula, and Tom is a cat, represented here. Using universal instantiation, we can substitute the x's with Tom, given we have that fact. This gives us the statement, if Tom is a cat, then Tom can't catch mice. Notice that we can now drop the universal quantifier. Lastly, we can apply the modus ponens inference rule, basically saying, if Tom is a cat, then Tom can't catch mice. We know Tom is a cat, therefore Tom can't catch mice. Our next inference rule is existential instantiation. This is also known as existential elimination or scolmanization. This is because substitution takes place with what's called a scolum constant. This rule states that any existentially quantified variable in a true sentence can be replaced or substituted by a brand new constant, and the result is a true sentence. Here's the inference rule written out. For some x, px, therefore pc for some c. The assumption here is that c is a brand new constant, not occurring in this or any other sentence in the knowledge base. It's basically a placeholder. It's convenient to reason about this unknown object rather than constantly manipulating this existential quantifier in our formulas. Here's an example for this inference rule. Here's our starting formula in our knowledge base. There exists some cat that can't catch mice, represented by this formula. Some cat is a placeholder name for something that is a cat, represented here. We'll apply existential instantiation to give us if some cat is a cat, then some cat can't catch mice. Again, we've substituted in some cat for x, giving us this new formula. We can now apply the modus ponens inference rule and conclude that some cat can't catch mice. Next, let's talk about universal generalization. This is also known as universal introduction. It states that any sentence shown to be true for an arbitrary C can be generalized with a universal quantifier. In this case, PC must not have been deduced from anywhere in the knowledge base where C is a free variable. Here's the inference rule for universal generalization. Given PC for an arbitrary C, we can conclude that for every X, PX. The universal generalization is really more useful for manipulating sentences when we're going about trying to prove things. For example, let's say we have the statement X squared is non-negative. We know that this statement, which we'll refer to as PC, is true for any C in the domain. Therefore, we can apply universal generalization to add a universal quantifier. So now we can add this to our knowledge base, for all x, p of x. Here's an example of a proof, where we're trying to show that the following expression is true. To do this, it turns out we only need to demonstrate that this first expression is true. Here we have an implication, where the first part implicates the second. So, if this is true, then we can conclude this. Given the deduction method, we can assume that the first part is true, thus we only have to demonstrate that the other item is also true. From the first part of the formula, we have two parts separated by a conjunction, an AND. These two parts go into our knowledge base. We have for all x, if p of x, then q of x, and for all x, p of x. We begin our proof by applying universal instantiation to the first formula, giving us the third. Then we can apply our universal instantiation to our second formula, giving us formula 4. Now we can apply modus ponens to formulas 3 and 4 to give us formula 5. Here's where universal generalization comes in handy. Now we can apply it to formula 5, giving us formula 6. Formula 6, of course, was the target thing we were trying to prove. Now let's introduce existential generalization. This is also known as existential introduction. It states that any sentence shown to be true for some c can also be generalized with an existential quantifier. Notably, x cannot have been a variable in pc. Here's the inference rule itself. Given p of c for some c, we can add to our knowledge base for some x p of x. The intuition behind existential generalization is actually captured by this next natural language sentence. If everyone is selling stocks, then we know that somebody's selling stocks. Let's look at an example. We have x squared is non-negative as our statement. We represent this as PC 
which is known to be true for any C in the domain. Given this, we can use existential generalization to add an existential quantifier, giving us this formula. Similarly, this is useful in manipulating formulas in proofs. Here's another example of a proof that you can work through on your own if you'd like. Here we're trying to prove this following formula, which is another implication between the left side and the right side. Using the deduction method, we can derive this formula instead. Now we have two formulas on the left separated by a conjunction. This allows us to include them separately as part of the knowledge base. Again, we now just have to prove this expression. Now let's discuss some special cases, specifically something called vacuously true generalization. This happens when a domain is empty, making a for all statement true, given that there are no examples. However, this is truth in an unimportant or uninteresting sense. Here's an example. Think of the sentence, every high school student in this course got an A. This can be expressed with this formula. Presumably, there are no high school students in this course, so X is an empty set. That makes this statement true by default. Of course, this isn't a very interesting conclusion. Here's another example. Some children are happy. In fact, all children are happy. Here we have a universal quantifier applied to HX, and we conclude an existential quantifier, and we conclude an existential quantifier HX. The simple implication being made here is that if all children are happy, this still means that some of them are. Now let's review some other important inference rules that are specific to first order logic. The first is universal modus ponens. This is basically just an elaboration of the modus ponens we learned in propositional logic. If for all x p of x, then q of x. And we know p a for some a in domain x. We can then conclude q a. Next we have the universal modus tollens. This says, if for all x p x, then q x. Also, negate q a for some a in domain x. Then we can conclude negate p a. Without getting into too much detail, there are similar formalizations for other inference rules in first order logic, including addition, disjunctive syllogism, conjunction, and simplification. The important thing to know here is that each of these inference rules has its own formal formulaic representation in first order logic. However, the basic idea behind each inference rule is the same. Next, let's briefly look at proof theorems through the lens of first order logic. First up, in first order logic, we have what's called logical consequence rather than entailment. Here's the formal definition. A formula G is a logical consequence of these formulas if and only if for every interpretation I, if I entails the conjunction of these formulas, we know that I entails G. Defining this is the first step to automating reasoning in first order logic. Here the proof process is basically a search and inference rules serve as the operators to conduct that search. Of quick note, the logical inference problem in first order logic is what we call semi-decidable. In other words, algorithms exist that say yes to every entailed sentence, but no algorithm exists that says no to every non-entailed sentence. This is related to the idea of satisfiability and validity being undecidable. Next, let's examine the deduction theorem that we learned about in propositional logic. There, it's stated P entailed Q if and only if, if P then Q is a tautology. In the context of first order logic, this is how that same deduction theorem would be written out. Next, we have proof by refutation or contradiction. In propositional logic, it looked like this. A knowledge base entails Q if and only if the knowledge base and negate Q is unsatisfiable. This is how we'd write that same proof theorem in first order logic. Again, moving towards automating reasoning, we have what are called reasoning systems. These include theorem provers, logic programming, and expert systems, which we'll learn a lot more about later. Theorem proving, or the manipulation of first order logic sentences to demonstrate proofs of entailment, can be useful in certain more complex problem domains such as mathematics. However, in this course, we'll focus on simpler but more restricted deduction and inference methodologies that are widely used in expert systems. This includes propositionalization, resolution, forward chaining, and backwards chaining. Next, we'll cover four different strategies that you can use to automate reasoning in first order logic. The first is propositionalization, 
This is the simplest but maybe most restrictive approach. Here, we define propositional logic variables for every atomic formula in predicate logic for all interpretations. When it comes to quantifiers, they would need to be enumerated for every possible value in the domains. Once this is done, you can perform inference using any of the propositional logic strategies that we already covered, including truth table checking, proof by contradiction, and resolution. So basically, this approach requires that you take all of your predicate expressions, convert them to propositions, and then use the reasoning strategies we learned earlier to conduct your inferences. So let's go through propositionalization. First up, to create propositions from predicates, you might need to apply universal instantiation. This can be applied several times to add new sentences. The resulting propositional knowledge base will be logically equivalent to the original predicate one. You might also need to use existential instantiation. This can be applied once to replace the existential sentence. Technically here, the new knowledge base is not equivalent to the old, but it is satisfiable if and only if the old knowledge base was satisfiable. Let's look at a really simple example of propositionalization and propositional inference. Suppose that we have a knowledge base with the following predicate formulas. For all x, if there's a king x and greedy x, then x is evil. We also have king is John, greedy is John, and Richard is John's brother. To conduct propositionalization, we have to instantiate the universal sentence in all possible ways. In this simple example, we'll assume the domain of x is just John and Richard. Therefore, we need to go back and replace John and Richard any time x is used. This gives us the first formula substituted with John, and that same first formula substituted with Richard. The three following formulas remain the same. Notably, every first order logic knowledge base can be propositionalized so as to preserve entailment. The steps required to conduct inference with propositionalization in first order logic include 1. First, propositionalizing the knowledge base and the query, in other words, the conclusion. Next, you'll conduct a resolution based inference, and lastly, you'll return the result. The main issue with this approach comes into play when you have functions in your knowledge base. Functions can quickly become nested meaning that there can be infinitely many ground terms. For example, you can have this situation, where the function father John gets nested in father, which further gets nested in father. There's no limit to the depth of function nesting, which makes the search space infinite. However, with propositionalization, there is a way we can conduct this search a little bit more intelligently. A theorem from 1930 by Herbrand said, if a sentence alpha is entailed by a first order logic knowledge base, it is entailed by a finite subset of the propositionalized knowledge base. That's a little technical, but the basic idea is that for n is zero to infinity, do the following. Create a propositional knowledge base by instantiating with depth n terms, and then see if alpha is entailed by this knowledge base. So the idea here is to propositionalize a simpler version of the knowledge base based on some nested depth limit first. If at that point entailment isn't achieved, then you'll create a new knowledge base that explores the next level of depth, and so on and so forth. Let's go back to our example from before, where our domain includes John and Richard. Our query is, is x evil? Given these formula, the Herbrand theorem starts by creating a knowledge base of depth zero. At this level, the function father can't be nested at all, so we get father John and father Richard. If entailment isn't proved at this depth, then the algorithm moves on to depth one. This knowledge base includes everything from depth zero, as well as new propositions that are allowed at depth of one. For example, father nested in father John. Of course, there are problems with propositionalization. The main one is that it only works if alpha, our conclusion, is entailed, but the algorithm will loop infinitely if it's not. Further, the process of propositionalization generates a lot of irrelevant sentences that ultimately have no use in proving a conclusion. So this means that this form of inference can be very inefficient. Using our example from before, it may seem intuitive that evil John is entailed. However, the process of propositionalization produced lots of facts such as greedy Richard that are irrelevant to determining this entailment. Consider that with p k airy predicates and n constants, there are p times n to the k instantiation that you'd have to exhaustively incorporate into your knowledge base. This brings us to the question, can we do inference directly within the context of first order logic without having to translate everything back to propositional logic? So now let's take our first look at how you might do this. 
Let's say we have that same inference rule. In that example, we also had some facts that partially match the precondition. In other words, these parts. So King John partially matches King X and every Y greedy Y partially matches greedy X. So here we need to start by trying to match these up using substitutions. In this situation, we can do that with the following substitutions. Here the X in King X is substituted with John, and the Y in greedy Y is substituted with John. After doing so, the expressions here match the expressions up here. Again, substitution is the replacement of variables in a sentence with expressions. A further example here, we substitute X with Richard and Y with John. We apply this to the formula brother XY, giving us brother Richard John. The term unification means finding substitutions, in other words, unifier, that make different sentences look identical. There's an algorithm called unify that takes two sentences and returns a unifier for them if one exists. Let's take a look at unification. Here the goal is to search our knowledge base for sentences that unify with our formula knows John X. Each of these examples is showing the unify algorithm trying to find knows John X in the knowledge base, and it returns a potential unifier found in that knowledge base. It also provides the substitution required to make them a complete match. In our first example, X can be substituted with Jane, and here you can see how that substitution would give you a perfect match. Here you could substitute Bill for X and Y for John in order to get these two formulas unified. Proposed substitutions for unification can get more complex, as we see here, where X is substituted by Mother John. This last example shows a failure of unification. This failed because X in both formulas can't take the values of both Elizabeth and John at the same time to get these two to unify. However, there's a simple solution to this. Basically, the algorithm just renames variables to avoid name clashes. So in this example, we have a new variable name added called x17. And now we can substitute Elizabeth for x and John for x17. There are some other possible challenges in the unification process that I won't get into detail here, but you're welcome to explore further if you're interested. Now that we have a strategy to make different logical expressions look identical, we can perform inference using predicate logic. To do this, we can rely on generalized inference rules that use substitutions to let us make inferences, and these substitutions take place through this unification process we just covered. For example, there is a generalized modus ponens. Here's the original modus ponens in propositional logic and our new formal description in predicate logic. Note that to conduct our generalized modus ponens requires substitutions. The main advantage of generalized rules is that they focus on substitutions that allow the inferences to proceed and they focus on lifted inferences, where we do not have to propositionalize the sentence to make inferences. A little more on generalized modus ponens. Generalized modus ponens, referred to by the acronym GMP, combines universal generalization with the original modus ponens. Basically, given PC and QC, and if every x, PX and QX, then RX, we could derive RC. To use the GMP, it's assumed that all to use the GMP, it's assumed that all variables are universally quantified. Additionally, the knowledge base must be filled with what are called definite clauses, which we'll learn about more in a bit. It's worth noting that the GMP is complete for a knowledge base consisting of definite clauses. By complete, we mean that it can derive all sentences that are entailed. The GMP is also sound, which means that it only derives sentences that are logically entailed. If you're interested, below we have a proof demonstrating the soundness of the GMP. We might ask why the GMP is an efficient inference rule. Well, first it takes bigger steps, combining several small inferences into one. These steps are also more sensible. It uses instantiations that are guaranteed to help rather than just using random universal instantiations. It also uses a pre-compilation step which converts the knowledge base into a canonical form we call definite sentences. A sentence is in this definite form if it is a conjunction of definite clauses. To briefly explain a definite clause, take a look at this starting formula. This could be transformed to this definite form over here on the left. The left and the right are clauses separated by a conjunction. A definite clause is a group of propositions separated by ors, where each proposition can either be negated or not. However, in a definite clause, there must be exactly one non-negated proposition. 
So here that's A, and on the right that's B. Now we're going to bust out the big guns of first order logic inference. Specifically, let's revisit the idea of resolution. You might recall from propositional logic that we can say that a knowledge base entails a conclusion if we can also show that the knowledge base and negate conclusion is unsatisfiable. We also showed that in order to do this, we had to convert our formula to the conjunctive normal form, which was a conjunction of disjunctions. Also recall the process of resolution, where we took this conjunctive normal form and tried to eventually demonstrate that we could get an empty set, thus proving entailment of our conclusion. Resolution and first order logic will look a little bit similar, but does get a bit more complex. To use resolution and first order logic, we'll also need to convert our expressions to conjunctive normal form. Here, conjunctive normal form remains a conjunction of clauses where each clause is a disjunction of literals. However, now these literals can contain variables, and they're assumed to be universally quantified. It's good to know that every sentence in first order logic can be converted into an inferentially equivalent conjunctive normal form sentence. The procedure for converting to conjunctive normal form is similar to the one in propositional logic. Here we need to eliminate existential quantifiers, but universal quantifiers are okay. The next few slides will give an example of how you might convert a formula in first order logic to conjunctive normal form. We start with the statement, everyone who loves all animals is loved by someone. Here's the original formula. I'll briefly go through the steps and you can go back and look at them in detail at your leisure. The first step is to eliminate any biconditionals and implications. Here we only have implications, so we use the implication rule to give us this formula. Next, we want to move any negates inward. We can do this using a combination of De Morgan's Law and equivalence of negated quantification. Now we're left with this formula. The next step is to standardize variables. In other words, each quantifier should use a different one. So for up here we have for some y and for some y again. Here we replace the y with a z. Next we scolemize. Next we scolemize. Every existential variable is replaced by a scolem function. Our next formula transformation looks like this. The next step is trivial. Just drop any existential quantifiers. They're not needed anymore. Lastly, distribute the ands over ors. This leaves us with conjunctive normal form where we have or clauses separated by an and. I give this example for context, but it's not necessary that you learn how to do this in practice. Let's say we wanted to solve a real world problem. Usually we'd start with some natural language that we need to convert into some kind of knowledge base. So let's give an example of this. Our goal here is to translate the following natural text into first order logic sentences. Specifically, the law says that it is a crime for an American to sell weapons to hostile nations. The country Nano, an enemy of America, has some missiles, and all of its missiles were sold to it by Colonel West, who is an American. Armed with this knowledge, our goal is to prove that Colonel West is a criminal. Given that paragraph, we can derive the following formulas as the knowledge base. For example, if missile X, then weapon X, and American West. Next, we want to convert these formulas to conjunctive normal form, and we get the following. Lastly, because we're conducting resolution, we want to add the query not criminal West because our starting question is asking whether West is a criminal. Thinking back to propositional logic, we have this as the resolution rule. First order logic resolution is refutation complete for general knowledge bases. This means that it can be used to confirm or refute a sentence P, not to generate all entailed sentences. As discussed, this requires the knowledge base to be reduced to conjunctive normal form, and we used a generalized version of this propositional resolution rule. Here is the formal first order logic resolution rule. It works pretty much the same, where if we have these two formulas and we use this substitution, we can conclude the following and add it to our knowledge base. Notice here that rich and not rich will cancel each other out, leaving unhappy with our substitution of ken for x. So now let's take a look at applying the resolution steps to the conjunctive normal form of the knowledge base and our negation of the conclusion we're trying to prove. Here again is the knowledge base for our problem in conjunctive normal form. While normally this process would be conducted as part of a search of many possibilities, I'm just going to show you the correct series of steps 
that would need to be taken in order to prove that West was a criminal using resolution. We start with one of the items from our knowledge base, as well as our query, not criminal West. In order to use resolution to combine this with this, and ultimately cancel out criminal, we need to unify them first. So right now our focus is on so right now, our focus is on unifying criminal X with criminal West. We can do this by substituting in West for X. We do this, and now criminal X and West cancels out, but at the same time, West is substituted for every X in this original formula. This gives us negate American West, or negate weapon Y, or negate cells West YZ, or negate hostile Z. The next correct step in this proof is to grab the following from the knowledge base. To resolve this formula with this one, no new substitution is required. American gets cancelled out, giving us this new formula. Next up we grab this formula from the knowledge base, and we have to go about unifying them before we can combine them with resolution. Notice here that weapon has an X on this side. Notice here that weapon has an X on this side, but a Y over here. So you might be asking what do we do next? Well again we just use a simple substitution. So here we're going to replace x with y over on this formula. Now we have weapon y, which will cancel with negate weapon y, and negate missile x becomes negate missile y. Now we have this new formula added to our knowledge base. The next correct step grabs this from the knowledge base. We want this to cancel with missile, so we need to substitute in y for m1. This also changes the y over here to an m1. Next we'll grab this expression from the knowledge base. Here we're going to try and cancel out cells, and again we have to unify them. Specifically, X will need to become M1, and Z will need to become Nano. Cells now cancels out, and we make the rest of our substitutions as we've done before. Now we have negate missile M1, or negate owns Nono M1, or negate hostile Nano. Next, instead of grabbing something from our original knowledge base, we're going to grab one of the new items that have been added to our knowledge base during this process, specifically Missile M1. Now Missile M1 and Negate Missile M1 will cancel without any substitution required, giving us Negate Owns Nono M1 or Negate Hostile Nano. Next we'll grab this from the knowledge base, and Owns will cancel, and we're left with Negate Hostile Nano. Next we'll grab this formula from the knowledge base, and unify Hostile X with Hostile Nano, substituting in Nano for X. This resolves to negate enemy Nano America, where Nano is now substituted for X. Now checking our knowledge base, we find that we have enemy Nano America, which will resolve to an empty set when combined with negate enemy Nano America. Because we've finally found an empty set, we've proven that West is a criminal. Next, we're going to take a detour back to propositional logic, where we're going to learn first about horn clauses, and then we'll dive into the most practical form of reasoning that we'll cover in this course, called chaining. First off, recall that resolution in propositional logic is refutation complete, and this completeness makes it an important inference method. However, in many situations, the full power of resolution is not needed. After all, resolution in general can be exponential in space and time requirements. Some real-world knowledge bases satisfy certain restrictions on the sentence form. This enables them to use a more restricted and efficient inference algorithm. Specifically, by reducing all clauses to what are known as horn clauses, resolution becomes linear in space and time. So let's start by defining definite and horn clauses. As mentioned before, a definite clause is a disjunction of literals with exactly one positive. Here's an example. Notice that B is the one and only positive and the rest are negated. A horn clause is a disjunction of literals with at most one positive. This is slightly more general than a definite clause because they also include what are known as goal clauses that have no positive literals. Here's a horn clause that's also a goal clause. Notice that this definite clause is also a horn clause. Horn clauses are closed under resolution. This means that they have the important property that if you resolve two horn clauses, you get back a horn clause. In knowledge bases that only have horn clauses, every definite clause can be written as an implication. Here the premise is a conjunction of positive literals, and it's assumed that the conclusion is a single positive literal. Here's our target implication. The premise is a conjunction of positive literals, and the conclusion is a single positive literal. And this can be transformed to our definite clause. In horn form, the premise is called the body, 
and the conclusion is called the head. A sentence that is comprised of only one positive literal is also known as a fact. We can write this in propositional logic simply as if true, then A, where A is the proposition that is a fact. When you have a knowledge base comprised only of horn clauses, inference can be accomplished using either forward chaining or backwards chaining algorithms. Both algorithms are natural. In other words, the inference steps are easy to follow and understand. This type of inference is the basis for what is known as logic programming. The deciding of entailment can be done in linear time according to the size of the knowledge base. Let's start by defining forward chaining. Here we want to determine if a single proposition, known as the query, is entailed by the knowledge base. Forward chaining starts with the known facts, in other words, the positive literals, in the knowledge base. If all premises of an implication are known, the head is added to the knowledge base as a fact. In other words, if we know A and D, then we add B as a fact to our knowledge base. This process continues until either either the query is added to the knowledge base, which means that we've proved our query, or no further inferences can be made, and we haven't. Here's an illustration of the forward chaining process. In this example, let's say that Q is our query here at the top. A and B here at the bottom are facts in our knowledge base. Multiple links joined by an arc indicate a conjunction, where every link must be proved. Multiple links without an arc indicate a disjunction. In other words, any link can be proved. In this example, here's our original set of propositions, starting with our facts A and B. Here are the same propositions in horn clause form. Starting with facts A and B, we can see from this proposition that we can conclude L. However, there's another way to conclude L, A and P, represented here, also pointing to L. Now we have L as well as B, so we can use this proposition to get M. Now we have both L and M, so we can use this proposition to give us P. Finally, we have P, so we can use this proposition to give us Q, and prove our query. Forward chaining is sound because every inference is essentially an application of modus ponens. Forward chaining is complete, because every entailed atomic sentence will be derived. Forward chaining is an example of the concept of data-driven reasoning. In other words, reasoning starts with known data. Now let's look at backwards chaining. Backwards chaining works backwards from the query. One of the best parts of backwards chaining is that if Q is already in the knowledge base and is true, then you're done. You've already proven it. Otherwise, the algorithm finds those implications in the knowledge base that have Q as its conclusion. If all premises of one of those implications can be proved true by backwards chaining further, then you can ultimately prove that Q is true. Backwards chaining is a form of goal-directed reasoning. It's more useful for answering specific questions such as, what shall I do now, or where are my keys? Often, the computational cost is much less than linear in the knowledge base because the process touches only relevant facts, unlike forward chaining. Here's an illustration of backwards chaining. Here, we're basically testing conclusions as hypotheses, and we work backwards from Q. The first step is to check if Q is in our fact base, which it's not, only A and B are. Next, we find the first inference rule with Q as its conclusion. Next, we have to try and prove P, because if P is true, we know Q is true. We look for P in our facts, but don't find it. So next, we have to find an implication with P in the conclusion. Now to show that P is true, we have to show that L and M are. However, neither in the fact base, so now it's up to us to also prove L and M. We'll start with M, so we find an implication with M in the conclusion. B is in our fact base, but L isn't yet, so we still need to prove L. We find two implications with L in the conclusion. The first one relies on A and P, but we haven't proven P yet. In fact, we're still trying to prove P. So we move on to the next. However, this next implication allows us to prove L given the facts we have in our knowledge base, A and B. How, as a result, we've now proven Q to be true. Now that we've been introduced to chaining from the simpler perspective of propositional logic, now we'll look at chaining in first order logic. In first order logic, chaining also requires that our formulas be in definite clauses. These definite clauses closely resemble propositional definite clauses, but they can include variables. All clauses are considered to be universally quantified, and therefore they're typically omitted by default when being written out. Definite clauses are either atomic, or like before, they're an implication whose antecedent is a conjunction of positive literals 
and has a consequent with a single positive literal. Here are a couple examples of first order definite clauses. These two are atomic, and this one is an implication in the previously mentioned form. Notably, not every knowledge base can be converted into a set of definite clauses. This is because definite clauses have that single positive literal restriction. To show how forward and backwards chaining works in first order logic, we're going to revisit the example that we used for resolution. In that example, our goal was to prove that Colonel West was a criminal. Here we show how that knowledge base could be converted to a set of definite clauses in propositional logic. For example, it is a crime for an American to sell weapons to hostile nations. We get this expression that we should be familiar with from before. Feel free to take some time and look through the rest of these and see how they're translated. Similar to in propositional logic, the forward chaining algorithm here starts from known facts and triggers all rules whose premises are satisfied and adds their conclusions to the known facts of the knowledge base. This process repeats until the query is answered. This pseudocode gives a simple but inefficient version of the forward chaining algorithm described here. Let's walk through the forward chaining process with this aforementioned example. Here at the top are the starting implications in our knowledge base, and below we have facts also in our knowledge base. Our goal is to prove that West is a criminal. For now, we'll put our facts down here at the bottom of the page. First, we use our existing facts to see which new facts we can derive from the knowledge base. We can use the implication if missile x, then weapon x, as well as a substitution where we give x m1 to give us the new fact weapon m1. Combining missile m1 and owns nano m1, and using this implication, substituting in m1 for x, we get cells west m1 nano, now added to our fact base. Lastly, we can use enemy nano American with this implication to give us hostile nano, also added to our fact base. At this point, our fact base is comprised of these six facts. Next, we look to see if there are any new facts that we can add to our knowledge base. We can, in fact, now use this top implication and these four facts, along with appropriate substitutions, to conclude that West is a criminal, which is then added to our knowledge base and our proof is complete. Let's briefly review some properties of forward chaining in first order logic. First, they're sound and complete for first order logic definite clauses. It's also important to know that forward chaining may not terminate in general if a query is not entailed. This is unavoidable as entailment with definite clauses is semi-decidable. Some more on forward chaining efficiency. Here's an observation. It should be observed that there's no need to match a rule on iteration k if a premise wasn't added on iteration k minus 1. Instead, it would be better to match each rule whose premise contains a newly added literal. In other words, forward chaining wastes effort on matching and adding new literals that don't actually do anything to help us prove our conclusion. Matching in itself can be expensive. Notably, database indexing allows us a faster strategy to retrieve known facts. However, matching conjunctive premises against known facts is known as NP-hard. Due to its simplicity, forward chaining is widely used in deductive databases, and there are some strategies that exist to speed up forward chaining algorithms to some degree. Now let's turn our attention to backwards chaining. Backwards chaining can also be thought of as an and-or search. By or we mean that the query can be proved by any rule in the knowledge base. The and part means that all conjunctions in the premise of that implication must be proved. Again, backwards chaining works backwards from the query, with the algorithm finding implications in the knowledge base that have the conclusion Q. If all premises of one of those implications can be proved true by backwards chaining, then Q is true. Otherwise, the search will continue. If you're interested, here's the pseudocode for a backwards chaining algorithm. Let's walk through the same example from before, now using backwards chaining. In this case, our goal is to prove that West is a criminal. So our algorithm starts with the implication in the knowledge base that has the matching criminal x as its conclusion. So our first substitution is obviously replacing x with west. Next, our goal is to prove every single one of these clauses in the inference. We'll start with American x. We already have the substitution west for x, so we can make that here without adding any new substitutions. Since we find American west in our fact base, we've now proven this branch to be true. Next, we need to prove weapon y. So we go to the knowledge base and find an implication with weapon in the conclusion. However, x and y don't match. So now we substitute in y for x 
and we can add missile y to our knowledge base. However, missile y isn't yet proven. In looking at our fact base, we see that we have missile m1. So down here we substitute in m1 for y and have now proven missile y to be true. In our next branch, we need to prove that cells xyz is true. So we find an implication with cells at the end. We've already substituted in west for x, so we replace that here. And we've already replaced m1 for y. This leaves z. So we need to substitute in z for nano, since that's what we need to do to get it to match this formula. With these replacements, we get two new facts to add to our knowledge base. We already know missile m1 is true, but now we've also confirmed that owns nano m1 is true. So this branch has now been resolved as true. Lastly, we need to prove that hostile z is true. This implication has hostile x in its conclusion. So we'll need to replace x with z in order to get them to match. However, z has already been substituted by nano. So with two substitutions, we end up with hostile nano. Using the substitution of nano for x, we end up with a new fact, enemy nano America, coming from this implication. Now we've proved this final branch, and we've proven our query, west is a criminal, using backwards chaining. Here are some other properties of backwards chaining. It uses what's known as a depth-first recursive proof search. The search space is linear in terms of the size of the proof. However, it's considered to be incomplete due to the fact that it can get into infinite loops. This can be fixed by checking the current goal against every goal on what's known as the stack. The stack is the set of things that still need to be proven. A naive implementation of backwards chaining can be inefficient due to repeating sub-goals, both successes and failures. But this can be fixed using a caching of the previous results, but it requires extra storage space. Overall, backwards chaining is widely used for logic programming. Here we give a quick reminder of the major first-order logic inference approaches that we've learned about today in this lecture. The first was resolution-based inference. Recall that it's refutation complete for a general knowledge base. It requires the first-order logic to be reduced to conjunctive normal form, and it uses a generalized version of a propositional inference rule. Later we talked about forward chaining, which uses the generalized modus ponens to add new atomic sentences, which uses the generalized modus ponens to add new atomic sentences to the knowledge base. It requires the knowledge base to be in the form of first-order definite clauses, and it's useful for systems that make inferences as information streams in. Lastly, there's backwards chaining. It also uses the generalized modus ponens to add new atomic sentences, and it requires the knowledge base to also be in the form of first-order definite clauses. However, it works backwards from a query to try and construct a proof. It can suffer from repeated states and incompleteness, but it's extremely popular and useful for query-driven inferences. Note that all of these methods are generalizations of their propositional equivalents. In other words, they're lifted. A brief shout out to logic programming. Prolog is the most widely used logic programming language. As its basis, Prolog uses backwards chaining with horn clauses and some other bells and whistles. Prolog has been widely used for expert systems, natural language systems, and compilers. Here's a summary of today's lecture. We began by covering first-order logic inference rules, including operators for manipulating first-order logic sentences. Then we discussed first-order logic theorem proofs. We showed how this can be elegant, but often impractical. Next, we moved on to deduction via propositionalization. This approach is simple, and we can fall back on our propositional logic inference rules, but it's generally inefficient. Next, we warmed up to the idea of inference using first-order logic expressions. We learned about unification and the generalized modus ponens that would be important downstream in chaining. Next, we covered the first of three major inference strategies applied in first-order logic. Specifically, we started by learning about resolution which is a complete and efficient proof system for first-order logic. Next, we backtrack to propositional logic and learn about horn clauses and the basics of both forward and backwards chaining. Lastly, we return to first-order logic and chaining, where we learned about definite clauses in first-order logic, as well as both forward and backwards chaining in first-order logic. Here's our quote of the day. Nothing is proved. All is permitted. A quick reminder that assignment two will be due after the second module. The specific date is on the syllabus. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next lecture.